Dr. Stephen Fox. Welcome back to Shrink Wrap Radio. Hi. Hi, Dr. Van Nuys. I'm glad to be here. Yeah, well, it's good to have you on the show again. It's been about five years since you were on episode number 381, Dreams as Guides to the Soul. Yes. yes. And Yeah. And uh, before we get into your latest book, which will be the focus of our discussion, I want to thank you publicly for being such a longtime listener and financial donor to Shrink Wrap Radio. I really appreciate it. Uh, yes, I'm. I'm glad to support it. It's, it's it's easily the best podcast on psychology that I listen to. Oh yay! <laughs> yeah, when I started, there weren't any other podcasts on psychology. I'm pretty yeah. sure 13 years ago. Now there are tons. So I'm lucky to uh, retain good listeners like you. <laughs> yeah. So today we're going to be discussing your very personal book which is titled Multiple Sclerosis, Mission, Remission, Healing MS Against All Odds. Uh, This is such a a personal story. Was it a hard book to write? Uh, The difficulty of really revealing yourself totally. I mean, I struggled with it. It, um, I spent six to eight months trying to decide how what level of personalness I wanted to do. And finally yeah. I decided there was no way, uh, if I was going to do something different, something valuable, it, it would be my own experience. Uh, and to do that, I had to, I had to get very personal because I think MS and a lot of chronic diseases are caused by a multiplicity of factors. Right. And, and so basically my point of view is, you have to address a multiplicity of factors. You have to do many different things until you reach that critical point where you reach critical mass and, and you start to heal. Yeah, well, that's, that's sort of the gist of, of your story in a way, a thumbnail of it. So there was some resistance that you had to overcome, it sounds like, too. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I literally have trained myself. I, I'm a very private person in many ways. Uh-huh. Uh, these, are, these are all my inner thoughts and feelings. Um, I have never exposed myself to this point. But I, I don't think it's, the book is interesting unless you do that. I agree. Uh, someone who's just been diagnosed with MS, they want to hear the inner struggles and what you're going through and how you're dealing with it. And when I look at some other MS books, I don't get that personal flavor. I mean, we can all read the research. We can all read the, the scientific articles. Yeah. Um, but I, I think people at a gut level, um, you know, you talk about the healing effect, the placebo effect, which adds to the healing effect. Uh, you got to believe in what you're doing or it, or it is not going to work. Yeah. And I want to rush in here to say that although your story is about multiple sclerosis, uh, listeners should not tune away (laughs) just because they don't have multiple sclerosis, because we've uh, made the title kind of generalize that the things that you talk about in your book could be applied to a wide variety of chronic illnesses or other sorts of, of life experiences, really, other sorts of life challenges. And so I think that this uh, interview is going to be relevant to to anyone. So uh, I, I, think, I think to begin with, to start to heal, you start with the medical approach. But after that, I mean, I think the medical approach takes you only so far, usually. Uh, it's usually a lot of guesswork, a lot of finding what is right for you, uh, finding which alternative treatments, uh, you know, you believe in that your subconscious is most likely to respond to. Um, and so it's going to be a little bit different for each one uh, sure. each person. But I, I think what I'm trying to describe is the method of finding the things that are right for you. Uh, I did many different things. Um, uh, not all of them will work for everyone, of course, but it's likely that some of them will work for a lot of people. So uh, take us through your story. When did you first come down with MS? Uh, it was January of 1991 when I was diagnosed. 
And, and you were 36 years old, I recall reading in the book, and, and you're married to a psychiatrist. I was married to a psychiatrist. She died last year. Last oh, I'm July. so sorry. Yeah. She, yeah. Was, she was expected, she was not expected to live until she was 40. Um, she, we, we were married. Before we were married, they used to meet with me and say, well, are you sure you know what you're doing? Uh, she's not likely to live more than 10 years. Well, we were married 32 years, so. Yeah, yeah, so you were both, you both were struggling with uh, physical challenges and, uh, and I'm sure emotional challenges, and somehow you, you both did so well against those, and uh, she plays such an important part in your story, and I came to appreciate her quite a bit, just as you wrote about her. So let's, but stepping back now in your own story, what was the impact? How did you deal with the emotional impact of getting that diagnosis? Um, <laughs> the first, the first stage really is denial. Um, I, the doctor undoubtedly told me I had MS, but I di didn't want to hear it. I'd been healthy most of my life. Um, and I didn't hear it. Um, I thought he was talking to my wife uh, a long time, um, but I didn't realize that he had told her that I had MS and we were quiet on the drive uh, back to her work. But uh, she, I got out of the car and I said, well, I guess we'll just keep on trying to figure out what's going on with me. And she said, what are you talking about? You have MS. I, I said, MS? She said, you wow. heard me, the doctor said you have MS. Um, I, I guess being a psychologist doesn't prevent repression. <laughs> right, or, or major denial to the point yeah. of shutting down, <laughs> yeah. figuring out your hearing. And uh, now I, so I know that you set out, you, you, well, first of all, I want to underscore that you were very physical before that. I mean, you're, here you are, you're 36 years old, you've been involved in martial arts, you're working on getting your black belt, and uh, you've just been a very physical guy. Uh, and then to get this news uh, was so shocking. And at some point you decided that you needed a miracle, and, that, and you set out to, to, because the word is that MS is incurable. And, yeah. uh, and so we hear that over and over again. That's, yeah. that's part of what you have to overcome. So um, to skip a, ahead a little bit here, let me just ask you: Did you get your miracle? Your miracle? Have you been cured? Um, if if there is a cure, I think this is what it looks like. There isn't hardly anything I can't do that I used to do. Um, my writing continues to improve. That tends to be a good barometer. Yeah, yeah, that's great. And how many years has it been? Uh, 27. 27 <laughs> years, and you're still hanging in there. I'm in better health now than I was five years after I got it. Wow. Wow. That, that, so that's, that's the miracle that we want to get into here. And uh, so what were the steps and attitudes that you decided to take? Uh, I mean, there was a certain attitude that you set out with it in order to lick this. Uh, can you yeah. tell us about that? Um, my wife had always been into alternative things. Uh, she, she prescribed a lot of medications, but she always recommended doing the alternative stuff with it. Uh, one of the first things I did was I went to therapy. Uh, you're going to be depressed. There, there, there's no doubt about it. Uh, the person uh, that I saw was an expert in dream interpretation. She had gone through Jung's Institute in Switzerland. Um, uh -huh. I also, my wife and I had both uh, had acquaintance with Reiki. We were both third degree Reiki people, uh, one step away from being masters, I guess. Um, so we started doing that more intensely. And it's the sort of thing where you get better with practice, I believe. Um, I so, looked up so, diet. I, yeah. I, I followed the standard MS diet back then. 
was to avoid wheat. And I think the reason for that is that wheat has the most uh, uh, germs in it, or the most uh, diseases in it, at least at the time it did. Um, and the thought was, well, maybe that some of that gets into the wheat and it stimulates your immune system. I still avoid uh, wheat now, although probably for somewhat different reasons. Um, it, it, if I do eat wheat, I will feel some minor dizziness. <laughs> so uh, I still, I, but I can, eat, I can eat most anything else. Okay. So, you know, step one, it sounds like in the process was go into therapy. If you've got a chronic illness, you're going to have an emotional, a big emotional and ongoing reaction to that. Yeah. And so getting into therapy with, with a good therapist that you can bond with uh, is really key to being able to deal with it. Uh, and also being open to alternative source of healing and yeah. Uh, yeah so so those are two big things and you you write i have shifted toward the belief that a bio psycho medical behavioral alternative spiritual approach <laughs> stands the best chance of producing miracles i love yes. that quote so it's not like you're not one of those people that throws out western medicine and goes straight no. to alternative no. I want to say, to be successful, I believe you have to be open to alternative medicine too. The uh, original treatment that made the, the biggest dent, I mean, um, they just came out with the first MS medication, beta serin, the year I was diagnosed. I actually had to enter a lottery to get that medication. Yeah. Um, later on, uh, I found this experimental medication. There were six MS patients who were flat on their backs. They were expected to die. They could not walk. Uh, and they gave them big bags of steroids for three days in a row, and then gave them a shot of cytoxin uh, to modify their immune system. And they did that every, with, with myself, four of those six people got up and walked. So I convinced, uh, uh, a neurologist at the Barrow Neurological Institute uh, to do this treatment. He had always done the steroids and the cytoxin separately, but uh, this was combining both of them, which incidentally I think has a massive effect of simply shutting off your immune system. Mm -hmm. So it was dangerous, and I, I, I don't think they probably will do it on a large scale basis now uh, but they did it with me because i convinced them that i was i knew fully the consequences and i wasn't going to take any legal action if things went south yeah um, you know going but, uh, back to the uh western versus uh, uh alternative uh you write that in the short term in the initial stage you write the west is best when the illness becomes cr a chronic beast go east <laughs> yes. You know, basically, I'm recreating Maslow's uh, pyramid. You got to start with the physical first, and li literally, you, you go up the pyramid. Um, and you will reach a point, usually with medication, where you have reached the maximum improvement. Um, and usually, uh, additional, I mean, when they did those steroids with me, uh, I was doing physical therapy at the same time. And my physical therapist says, you have to be exercising every day after do it, doing this for at least two weeks. That's how long the effect last, lasted. She said, because I'm seeing you move muscles that I've never seen move before. Um, I mean, I, was, I had a, 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 a plastic leg brace. Uh, I was using a cane. I was having severe falls uh, each week. Um, so we used to joke, me and the uh, physical therapist, about why are we doing this? It doesn't, all we're doing is slowing down the rate at which the ship is sinking, you know, uh, <laughs> kind wow. of a gallows humor, I guess. Um, but, and we would laugh about it because I obviously was improving. Um, and that's, it wasn't supposed to happen. Uh, most doctors, they don't want to overbuild your, your hopes up too much. 
Sure. So they're very cautious about saying what a medication will or won't do. Are you able to turn the volume down a little bit more? Because I'm still hearing that growling come up. How's that? Okay, well, we'll hope for the best. So you, you, <clears throat> so physical therapy was another uh, a, a Western approach and one that maybe a, a lot of doctors would not have prescribed because, you know, it's going to be a sinking ship. And yet your determination was such, and, and you, again, you had an incredible physical therapist who really uh, kept her eyes out for signs of progress and kind of kept you going. So that sounds like it was important. Uh, you mentioned, um, and, and that was a mixture of Western and Eastern because she was also a yoga instructor. Okay, <laughs> great. So she would put together yoga exercises w with the standard physical exercises. And actually, yeah. I thought the yoga exercises were more, more helpful. Uh huh. Uh, and so basically, there's... I built it into my life, made it a regular part. And this sounds funny, but I did many of the exercises. Many of the exercises didn't require much room. And I just made it a habit. Whenever I went into the bathroom, I would do the, these some form of these exercises, at least. Uh -huh. um, and yeah. it's amazing how much exercise you can, you can do in a day doing that. Yeah. I yeah, mean, great. Um, at one point, my walking was so bad that I was having trouble lifting my leg up. Um, and literally, to exercise, to build those muscles up, I would crawl on the floor like a baby mm -hmm. <laughs> across the carpet for a half hour or something. Yeah, um, yeah, that makes sense. Now, you mentioned that your therapist was a Jungian and into dreams. Uh, can you say something about the role of dreams in the miraculous recovery? Maybe there are one or two dreams that stand out as uh, especially... Well, the most dramatic um, dream was... Um, I was starting to improve. I used to be a long distance runner, uh, but I was afraid to run because if I tried to run in the past, I would crash into the gravel. Um, but uh, I, after you got the MS, you would crash into the gravel. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Um, so basically before I would go to sleep, I would say to myself, I want a dream that I, I want my subconscious to, to tell me in a dream when I'm ready to run, okay? Yeah. And I had a dream that I did a flying roundhouse kick, which is the hardest kick you can do in Taekwondo. And I took that as a message that you're ready to run. Uh-huh. And, and, and so I did, and it worked. And I was, I didn't set any speed records, but I, I was able to run from that point on. Um, yeah, well, that's a great example of what they call dream incubation, where you kind of give yourself uh, your unconscious directions of uh, the, what you need to get in a dream. And uh, yes, it's a great example of one coming through. And, and also, your responsibility as the recipient of the dream to figure it out. And, and you had this intuitive sense that even though it wasn't a dream about running, you took the message. Yeah. 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 You want to, of course you want to go for theme and the theme was you, you, you're more capable of doing more physically than you think you can. Yeah. Yeah. I, I had an experience like that myself where uh, I got into uh, bicycling and I wanted to do what's called a century. They have them around here periodically, uh, big group rides, you know, of a, a a hundred mile ride in a huge group yeah. and I was feeling ambitious I think in my 50s and yeah. uh, wanted to be able to achieve that but I had sort of chronic stiff neck issues and I really had a strong feeling that uh, <clears throat> that that would be a problem that that would block my ability to stay on the bike that long because you have to support your head you know your the weight yeah. of your head on the bike I had a dream, and in the dream, there was this uh, woman, female figure, like a shamanic uh, goddess-type figure, and she was holding a bowl, and out of the bowl, streaming up into the air, was a sort of rainbow swirl of colors, and if I tipped the bowl one way or another, I could move that. It was very exciting to have control over moving this 
bowl around. And then at the end of that experience, she said, accept your healing. And so I took that in the way that you did. I thought I took that as uh, a statement that I could go on my hundred mile bike ride. And so the, the next within a day or two of that, I decided I would just jump on my bike by myself, not in a big group ride. And I uh, had a, a speedometer that told me the mileage. So I decided, well, I'm just going to ride my bike out to the coast and go as far as I can. And at 50 miles, I'll turn around and come back. And um, I was able to do it. <laughs> I was very sore at the end, but I was able to do it and later to go on a group ride or two like that. Yeah, so yeah, that's great. those dreams are important. And you, you also found important in your, in the creating your miracle, developing a skill at visualization. Yeah. Seems like so, so many psychological exercises, you're asked to visualize this or yes. that. Did you start out as a really good visualizer or not? I've always, I've always been pretty good at that. Yeah, um, that's a real gift, I think. Yeah. I, uh, I, I do a little bit of, of hypnosis uh, as therapy with people sometimes. Uh, and so I've been, been trained in, in using that. Um, but, it, you know, when you're meditating, you're visualizing. And it's, especially during physical therapy, um, I would literally practice as I watched the other person do it, you know, what it was likely to feel like, um, just noticing every, everything about the way they did it, trying to instill it in my subconscious. In, mm -hmm. in a way, you're convincing yourself that you can do it, <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think one of the most personal parts of the book is where you, uh, in, in a number of places, you discuss uh, the role of trauma in your life, personal trauma, yes. which, which maybe you speculate, and, it's, and certainly it makes sense to me that kind of the groundwork for chronic illness was maybe set in place by the difficulties of your childhood where you experienced a considerable abuse at the hands of your brothers. Yes. Uh, who would, you know, kind of torture you, beat you up, pin you down, et cetera. And they were big, powerful guys. They were older than you and powerfully built. And you were kind of a slender, uh, yeah. delicate flower to begin with. <laughs> <laughs> they could each bench press 400 pounds. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> oh, my goodness. And you couldn't so, get away from They were amateur them. boxers. Uh, you didn't want to get in a fight with them. Yeah, and somehow your parents did not intervene in your behalf on your behalf. Yeah, you know, I I was so afraid of them that I never said anything uh -huh. <laughs> in in their defense. Um, yeah. My father eventually uh, took action and uh, got them off the farm uh, simply because they were it was going too far. Um, but that that's the premise of my book. Uh, basically, partly what inspired me is I had a, a medical doctor that I was seeing in therapy, and she was saying that she she used to be squeamish about asking people if they'd been physically abused when they were younger. Mm -hmm. uh, but she says, I have found that so many times people with chronic illness were physically abused as children that I just considered a standard part of the intake, intake now. Um, I, and in particularly in, in uh, uh, immune system diseases where your immune system is t attacking yourself, mm -hmm. I think sometimes the abuse can, can, can convince you as a child to hate yourself. Wow. And literally, I, I, to me, it makes sense that that uh, hating, I mean, I used to say actively to myself as a kid that I hated myself. Oh, geez, it yeah. took me some time as an adult to get out of that habit. Right. Yeah, I can easily see how that could set the stage for, you know, psychological problems and physical problems. Uh, and we know that the two are not really as different as we think they are. Yeah. That we yeah. Are um, you know, that's what I emphasize in the book. Uh, the premise of the, of the book is that 
the abuse, it wasn't totally responsible. I think it made it more likely. It was one of the 20 factors. Yeah. That came together. Yeah. And um, a big goal that you had was to avoid having to be in a wheelchair because that was portrayed as uh, part of your trajectory. That you oh, could... I was told that by me. That, that's the singular flaw to my excellent therapist is that she would try to get me to accept that, yes, you know, someday you're, she wouldn't say it in, in so many words, but the gist of it was that uh, I had to realize that it was possible I was going to end up in a wheelchair, maybe even likely. Um, and I, I would sort of go along with it or pretend I was going along with it, but I never really did. I, 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 well, good for you. I mean, you can certainly understand why, why she would do that. You know, she would feel like it was her responsibility to, yeah. uh, to not let you stay in denial. And yet, <laughs> how does one balance that? You know, as well, a your therapist, you know, and, uh, when they did that experimental treatment with the steroids and the cytoxin, there was a ten percent chance that I could die. In fact, I got an inf infection after that that I was in the hospital for about two weeks, but I could have died from it. Um, but basically, you say to me, there's a 10% chance I can die, but there's a 90% chance I'm going to get better. I'll take that bet. Yeah, yeah. So there's a part of you, you know, there's really something in your own spirit that got you through this. And, and one of it was that was to not accept that idea that being in a wheelchair was going to be inevitable for you. That being you... a long distance runner, that was my nightmare. I mean, towards the, uh, towards the end, towards uh, uh, before the time when I started to get better, uh, I would be wheelchair through the airport simply because the airport was too big uh, and I would get worn out and couldn't walk very well. Sure. Um, and I just hated that. I just hated that. Yeah. And now 27 years later into living with all this, you're not in a wheelchair. Is that right? Not at all. I don't wear a brace. I don't use a cane. I can run if I want to. I work out. I do yoga. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I think I would have trouble keeping up with you, it sounds like. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, but I mean, these are, these are things uh, that, that anybody can do you know i i emphasize in the book that you have to decide for yourself what your risk tolerance is to me i wasn't i i wasn't afraid of dying as much as i was afraid of not getting better yeah yeah that, that was actually much worse to me than dying and, and one of the, one of the elements would take that attitude uh -huh. Uh, and I, I don't recommend that everybody take that attitude. You, you have to know yourself to know what, what's best for you. Yeah. Yeah. Now, another thing that you got into as part of your smorgasbord of uh, alternative treatments was prayer. Did you grow up in a uh, prayerful family? Uh, a very traditional Catholic uh, family. I, I have an uncle who's a priest. <laughs> um, okay. um, there was some speculation that I should be a priest when I was young, uh, and I thought about it. Um, when you're when you're on a farm in South Dakota and things aren't going well, uh, you you start to consider alternatives <laughs> like that. But uh -huh. I basically I I've had kind of an ambivalent relationship to the Catholic Church, um, uh, but they do such a good job of instilling certain beliefs in your subconscious that later on in life even if you reject most of those uh, there's a lot of them that are unobjectionable that you have in your subconscious that, that you can use for healing yeah and that's what i'm recommending to people is whatever was instilled in you as a child that has a positive value it's going to be easier to go with that rather than to develop something new. It's possible that you can find something new that's so fascinating and interesting that you go with that, because that affects you deeply subconsciously. Uh, but it's much easier to uh, make peace with what, what you were, with what you grew up with and to use that in a healing sense. 
Yeah, that's kind of like what uh, Jung was saying about uh, Westerners uh, maybe not being too quick to embrace uh, Eastern religions if they grew up with a with a different religion themselves. I think he was that, that, that really that really resonates with me. I you know I've always liked Buddhism, um, mm -hmm, and, and I. You know, I, I like the precepts of it, and I, I meditate, and that's probably more of a Buddhist uh, sort of thing. Um, but I, I never really felt like it was necessary for me to convert or to totally go with it, simply because if I was trying to be totally Buddhist, I would be a, a Catholic imitating being a Buddhist rather than being a full Buddhist, I thought. Yeah, yeah. Uh, speaking of Catholic ideas, uh, angels uh, plays a role, play a role in uh, in what you were doing, and you said that the. I want to make sure I understood this. That your wife was having dreams, and you were getting messages that you felt were angelic in a way through your wife's dreams. Do I have that right? Uh, you know, actually, I, I we sort of spent one night where she has amazing dreams. She actually was fairly psychic, and she, she would just have incredible dreams every so often. Uh, and so, you know, in the spirit of uh, trying anything I can, I asked her if she would try to incubate a dream about what I should do to help my health. And she had this dream uh, where an angel appeared to her and gave her four rules. And the first rule was to be non-judgmental. And that was like 70% of it. Uh, the second rule was to show inner beauty. And she said she could see me in the background and say, yeah, I'll show inner beauty. Like, <laughs> like I don't really believe it. Yeah. The third one was um, mirror the earth. And I talked about that in, in, in psychotherapy. And basically uh, what I came to believe that man was to follow natural cycles, uh, go to bed with the, the sun, uh, get up uh, in the morning with the sun, uh, be inactive when it's raining, uh, so on and so forth. Um, Interesting. The last one was the most spiritual uh, part of it. It was glorify the transfigurement. Okay, and it was, it was the noun, not the, the verb. Um, and what I took that to mean was I, that I was to be very grateful for the changes that, that I saw. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. And I tried to follow those as much as I can. Um, you know, one of the things the Catholic Church does very well is instill beliefs about angels and saints. In fact, <clears throat> when I pray, the only thing, virtually the only thing <laughs> that has ever worked is, is praying to, for me is praying to specific saints or specific angels. Interesting, yeah. You know, one thing we didn't mention was that your wife was legally blind, and she, and she was so when you met her. And it, yeah. all, and it makes me think that maybe as a compensation for not being able to see well looking out, that she had these gifts for looking inside and a, yeah. a kind of inner vision. Uh, she was very brilliant, and uh, like I say, she was very intuitive. I, it sort of ran in her family. I think she got it from her grandmother, who was a very sort of psychic. Um, but, you know, they, they let her graduate. They, they let her go through undergraduate college in three years. And they gave her, when she graduated from medical school, they gave her her undergraduate degree and medical degree simultaneously. And they, they knew she had major, major physical problems, and they wanted to get her out as a doctor as soon as they could. Yeah. yeah and she was, she was rated at the upper 1% of doctors on the test that, that they took. Wow. Uh, she belonged to this honorary uh, sorority uh, that, for medical people. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you mentioned the death of your sister who I guess or of one of did you have just one sister or more you, I you had, grew up uh, on a farm. I had four <laughs> sisters I had four sisters and I have uh, three brothers I'm the yeah. big kids 
Um, yeah, wow. So it was a big family. It was uh, on a farm yeah. in, in South Dakota. Yes. And um, <laughs> and <laughs> there, there was a lot of drama in all of that. And and one of your sisters became psychotic at some yeah. point, and, and yeah. then she she died. And that had what was the impact? of that on you that was during your your journey here yes um you know mental illness uh psychotic depression was a big factor for three people in my family i had an older sister who was in the state hospital from a, a young age from psychotic depression uh my sister kathy uh, she developed polydipsia which is an unusual condition uh but it happens every so often. Uh, the person believes they have to drink water to cleanse themselves. It's taking very concretely the idea that water represents emotion, and that you could cleanse yourself of negative emotions by drinking enough water. Uh, she was drinking water so heavily that um, we finally uh, got her into a hospital. Um, and somehow they got, she got out of the staff's uh, supervision and she went in a bathroom and they found her with her, with her mouth beneath the faucet, taking in water. And she threw off her electrolytes uh, so bad that she died. Wow. Um, wow. My, yeah. my father had bipolar disorder. Uh, he didn't really start, things didn't start to go bad until he was like in his 40s. Um, and I think that's where things start to get confusing in my family also. Mm -hmm. But my, my oldest sister, from about the age of 12 or 13, uh, she was in a state hospital one form or another. There was some uh, social worker who realized that she, they thought she was schizophrenic back then, but he realized that she wasn't schizophrenic, that she was depressed. They finally gave her the right medication, and, and she was released with supervision. So really, this going back to the theme of trauma, it sounds like there was just a lot of trauma running through the family as a kind of theme. And uh, I must say, it's a, you know, part of the miracle <laughs> is that you've come through all that and, you know, as a, and are able to function as a psychotherapist and a healer. Uh, for other people? So, uh, it makes it very easy to empathize with people with mental illness. Yeah. I've I never had so. any trouble with that. You know, they, they did a study once, why do people become therapists? And, and they, they uh, found that in many ways, the person that became a therapist frequently was a mediator in their family. And, mm -hmm. I, and I was very much that, especially yeah. my father and my mother. Yeah. Another uh, ingredient in, in your recovery uh, on the way to your miracle was, in fact, the Course in Miracles, um, which uh, I've had other guests who, over the years, who've yeah. made reference to the Course in Miracles. I have friends who uh, are big fans of uh, the Course in Miracles. You know, uh, that was written by a psychologist. That's right. That's right. Basically, she, she kept having this voice, li literally, uh, she had this ongoing voice that she transcribed what it would say to her, and that's how we came up with The, the Course in Miracles. Um, the biggest thing about The Course in Miracles is that uh, the biggest message is things are not as they appear to be. And when you're sick and have MS, that is good news. Um, because you, you have the thought that we're only seeing a part of reality. Um, there's uh, theoretical physicists can prove there's like 11 dimensions plus time. We see three of them. Uh, that leaves a lot of room for a lot happening that we don't see. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. And you mentioned Reiki, and uh, I know I've heard the term. Uh, it's uh, you know I'm in California, so <laughs> I'm going to hear about Reiki. But I, I've never experienced it. Don't know a lot about it. I, I actually learned more from your book than I knew before. But just say a little bit for our audience here what Reiki is. Um, basically, it's Oriental uh, laying on of hands, 
uh, um, basically the idea is that they believe there's energy flowing through the universe that flows through your body and that you can direct that energy in the form of heat uh, towards uh, others, people, people's uh, parts of their bodies uh, that will be healed with the help of the, of the life force you're generating through them. Uh, I was very skeptical about this. I was um, in my early 30s when I first experienced it. Uh, I had a friend who, she had Sikhs as a friend and they were very serious. They wore the turbans and the whole, the whole thing. Um, and we were talking about it with them and, and the lady who was, who was a master of this I said, well, do you want to experience it? And I said, okay. And uh, you lay down and they hold their hands like six to nine inches off, off different parts of your body. Um, and I had my eyes closed and I thought someone was standing on my stomach, on my abdomen, okay? And I yeah. opened my eyes and it was her with her hands about six inches from my abdomen. Now, I was not a believer. Uh, I, uh, I don't think I was under hypnosis. Uh, I was very skeptical, but she was able to generate a physical force like I had never experienced before or since. Yeah, she knew was, Yogi uh, Bunjan. Uh, he was the uh, man from India that brought Kundalini, Kundalini Yoga to the United States. And I got to meet, meet him once. Uh, yeah. So she was very interested. Yeah, I had a friend, uh, I had a couple of students who were uh, uh, in the Yogi Bhajan uh, hierarchy. Yeah. Uh, and you mentioned that uh, your wife, Deborah, had a pancreas kidney transplant, and maybe, maybe she was the first person to undergo that? She was the first person in Arizona. In Arizona. The Midwest has, had been doing it for a decade. Uh, but um, the West Coast is actually far behind the Midwest on these procedures. And I think huh. I know why that is, having lived in the Midwest. Uh, yeah. They have more agricultural colleges and connected with their medical schools. They have a perfect animal population to try transplants on. Um, and, and so literally, even the doctor that did the pancreas uh, a kidney transplant on her uh, was was from a hospital in Iowa that Debbie was born in. So there was kind of a synchronicity there. Uh, oh, you know what? Going back to the Reiki, uh, what it reminds me of is the early days of mesmerism. And, yes. uh, and Esdale, uh, a Scottish surgeon who worked in India, he would have his assistants make hand passes over the patient's bodies, sometimes for hours at a time, and then was able to do, you know, according to the history, incredible surgeries that would have been, you know, extremely painful and so on under other circumstances, but that this magnetism, which later we sort of talked ourselves out of the idea, oh, it's just suggestion and there are no yeah. magnets forces and so on but the reiki almost it sounds like it has a lot in common with yes if you take a course and, in hypnosis yeah. the one of the first things they will talk about is is uh mesmer memorization um, yeah basically i i think they view it as a form of hypnosis because hypnosis is known to affect pain levels and uh, frequently in the past when people were in severe pain uh, they would do hypnosis to have them yeah. dissociate themselves from the pain. Yeah, but it was later in the in the history of hypnosis that it began to be associated with with sleep as a kind of waking sleep, if you will, and the whole metaphor kind of moved away from any kind of energetic exchange. And now we have uh, people championing energy psychology uh, in, yeah. in various forms, and so you know. It sounds like there's something going on there. Yeah, with Reiki, I, I think with uh, mesmer, with mesmer, it was the emphasis was was equally on physical and uh, the psychological. With Reiki, it feels more physical. Mm -hmm. You don't feel like you're in an altered state when they're doing it. You you yeah. actively feel it. 
Yeah. Well, um, I've sort of uh, I've sort of covered all the points that I wanted to here, uh, as you know, and obviously there's a lot more material in this book. Uh, as we wind down, is there anything else that you'd like to add? Um, I think everyone's path to healing will be somewhat different. Um, what I'm throwing out is suggestions that people might use. Uh, they need to follow their own path. Uh, we have common commonalities because we're all human, uh, but these need to be tailored to your history, your beliefs, uh, what is most likely to work for you, including the placebo effect, you know, which, which only amplifies the healing effect. I, I very much championed the medical approach, especially early on. Um, and it is not Eastern versus Western techniques. It's Eastern and Western techniques. You need to throw everything you possibly can at it because you are so far behind the curve once you get the disease. Yeah. Well, it's an inspiring story, and I'm really glad, again, as I said, to have you in my audience and as a, such a strong supporter, and, uh, and what a wonderful, inspiring message you have. And uh, so, Dr. Stephen Fox, I really want to thank you for being my guest today on Shrink Wrap Radio again. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Van Nuys. It was a pleasure. Okay, so I do thank you. I'm going to turn off the recorders.